remember today in the class for this class i'll be following uh, my own book ezekiel uh, published in 2007 by uh, atc bangalore okay uh, first uh, i will be uh, giving an introduction to you introduction on the introduction i will i will present to you the man ezekiel his biographical details a prophet who is dumb a prophet who is confined to his house, a prophet in exile. Then the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. Uh, the book of Ezekiel, we have, as I, as I said, there are 48 chapters which can be divided into uh, 10 uh, different groups, 10 sections, 10 sections. You know, uh, the present book of uh, Ezekiel, this is the final result of extensive addition, addition and expansion. Not that Ezekiel sat down and wrote all these 48 chapters as we have today. No, that's not the truth. This is the final result of extensive addition. You know what? Editing. Extensive addition, addition and expansion. Okay, only at least this much as elementary uh, beginning knowledge you should just imagine or you should just uh, accept that this is the final result of extensive addition, addition and expansion. Now we have, after this, uh, different uh, uh, procedures, we have the final structure of 48 chapters in this book. And the uh, 10 sections, the first three chapters, uh, we call prophetic call. Prophetic call. Then, uh, show me the, the, the whole thing together. Uh, the first uh, three chapters that everybody see the all this ten together. Prophetic all chapters one to three. Then second section against prophecies against Jerusalem and Israel chapters four to seven. Prophecies against Jerusalem and Israel chapters four to seven. Then chapters eight to eleven. That is temple vision. Uh, this is a book of uh, this prophet has a lot of visions. So we will we'll have plenty of visions in this book. So chapters 18, 8 to 11, we have temple vision of the prophet. Then chapters 12 to 14, we have true and false prophecy. True and false prophecy, who are true prophets and who are false prophets. Then we have 15 to 19 chapters, we have images of Israel. In these chapters, we have images of Israel in various prophecies and enacted prophecies and visions and parables. Then chapters 20 to 24, we have the last phase of history. There, what we see is a uh, prophet speaking about the last phase of history. Then we have 25 to 32, oracles against nations. Oracles against nations. As you, you may have see, uh, learned from other prophets, all the major prophets have got, got a, a section, a, a considerable section of their book uh, containing oracles against nations. Here we have chapters 25 to 32. Then we have fall and rise, chapters 33 to 37. Fall and rise, 33 to 37. Then we have a Gog and Magog oracles, 38 and 39. You may have read this uh, a few times, but uh, probably you may have understood nothing because it is uh, apocalyptic in language. Not to be understood literally. If you are trying to understand literally, you will get nothing. That is uh, chapters 38 and 39. Then the last section, that is chapters 40 to 48, the vision of the temple and the law of Ezekiel. Vision of the temple and the law of Ezekiel. Now let us go to the first section, that is prophetic call. Prophetic call, uh, chapters 1 to 3. That chapter 2 is of the of my book. Chapter 1 is introduction. Chapter 2 is uh, chapters uh, 1 to 3. I discussed there. Prophetic call and commissioning. Prophetic call and commissioning. Then act of commissioning, then sign of eating the scroll, final sending, a prophet as a watchman, and shut indoors and under. Let's go back to the first section. That is uh, uh, first, that's introduction. Introduction. That is uh, man as a kill, yes. Man as a kill, biographical details. That is first of all, this prophet is unique, unique in the sense. This is a prophet who received his uh, prophetic vocation in exile, in Babylon in exile. 
most of the prophets most of the prophets whom we know they were uh, they were in uh, in jerusalem or or in northern israel but uh, this uh, particular prophet plus one anonymous prophet known as a second isaiah these two people two prophets exercised their prophetic ministry in babylon in exile unique so in, they were prophets exercising their ministry in a crisis time of the history of israel that is in babylon biographic details uh, this prophet was born in 623 bc in jerusalem and died in babylon in 570 bc once again when you look at uh, any any important persons especially uh, saints for example first we look at uh, their birth and death so this man he was born uh, in 623 and was buried in the land of exile, in Babylon exile in 570 BC. And 598 BC, that is, when he was 25 years old, there was the, 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 the there came, okay, the first fall of Jerusalem, 598 BC, uh, when Ezekiel was 25 years old, then the prince of the time, the 18-year-old 18 young prince, Jehoiakim, he was deported, he was taken, and his mother, uh, and all the prominent people of Israel, Jerusalem, and 10,000 people were taken to Babylon. Together with that, our prophet Ezekiel also was uh, deported to Babylon. So, 623, then 25 years, 598, at the age of 25, he was taken to, to Babylon. Remember, he was born in a Jewish priestly family. Anyone who is born, any, any man born in a Jewish family, priestly family, normally uh, looks forward to, become, uh, to becoming a priest, Jewish priest, serving in the Temple of Jerusalem. So Ezekiel, as a young man, was also preparing to become a priest, Jewish priest, to, to serve in the Temple of Jerusalem. Uh, but in the, uh, there are two traditions in the Old Testament. One is at the age of 25, uh, one would be ordained a priest. Another tradition is <coughs> at the age of 30, he would be ordained a priest. So, and uh, maybe different times these two traditions existed. Anyway, at the age of, uh, according to one tradition, at the age of 25, when normally a, a Jewish man would be ordained a priest, this man was not ordained a priest. But he was deported to Babylon. The next date is 593, five years later, when he was 30 years old. That is according to the second tradition, uh, when a man would be a Jewish man from a, a priestly family would be ordained a priest, he was ordained or he was called to be a prophet. He was called to be a prophet. But this was quite unusual because uh, according to the Jewish concept, according to the Jewish concept, Yahweh had his authority only within the borders of Israel. Their tradition or their understanding was that each nation had each nation had their uh, their own uh, king, their own uh, god. Each nation had their own god. If you have the Bible, the, since you have the Bible with you, if you can open your Bible. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Please look at it. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. And have a quick look at it. There, uh, El Elyon, that is God most high, he is distributing the nations of the world to all the smaller gods. And Yahweh was one, one of the smaller, smaller gods. And, according to this, according to this uh, Jewish belief, each nation had a God, and in uh, Judges 11, we see Jephthah, one of the judges, Jephthah telling the Amorite king, you have your God, Hamosh, we have our God, Yahweh. So each nation has its God, and God, whatever is given to the people by God, should be kept to them, by them. So, now, in other words, 
when a nation is captured, defeated and captured by another nation, it means their God has failed. Means in, in 598, when Israel was captured by Babylon, you and your Jewish people are taken to Bab Babylon, their understanding was, conclusion was that Yahweh lost. La Yahweh lost. Yahweh, the God of Israel, lost against the God of Babylon. So he had no, uh, no jurisdiction in Babylon. His, Yahweh's jurisdiction comes only within the borders of Israel. So when Ezekiel said in 593, he was given prophetic call, uh, Abbas did not accept it. What? What nonsense are you saying? Can Yahweh uh, do anything here in a, in a foreign land? We are in a Gentile land, unclean land. So Yahweh has nothing to do this. They did not believe it. And since they did not believe it, he had the challenge of explaining it, proving it. Hence, we have three chapters of the book of Ezekiel just on the, his prophet call. We have in other uh, books also. For example, Isaiah chapter 6 is about his prophet call. Or Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, 4 to 10 is about his prophet call. Or a, a small uh, prophet uh, Amos. His, uh, uh, his prophetic goal is given in uh, chapter 7, 14, and 15. But we have long, long uh, chapters, three chapters, just about the prophetic goal of, of uh, Ezekiel. He, had to, he took pains to explain or to defend before his people that actually it is genuine. He is not telling lie. Genuinely, he is a prophet. He was called by Yahweh, although he is in, in, in exile in a foreign land. Okay, 593, we reached up to 593 when he became king, he became a prophet. Then in 588, 588, he lost his wife. He, I just said in the book of Ezekiel, uh, his wife, the delight of his, his eyes, when he was just uh, 35 years old, his young wife died. It's all uh, symbolic and enacted prophecies. And his wife died, symbolic of the fall of Jerusalem the next year. 588, his, his wife died, and he was told not to mourn the death of his wife. And uh, they had their own uh, customs of mourning somebody's death. But he was asked not to do any of these mourning rites, because it was uh, an enacted prophecy. And it was a uh, symbolic of the fall of Jerusalem next year, 587. And most of his prophecies uh, were uh, re regarding the time uh, reaching up to 587. But he, his prophecies went up to 571, uh, uh, and he died in 570, and was buried in uh, Babylon. Then going over to uh, another aspect, a prophet who is dumb, a prophet who is dumb, in, in, you can take uh, Ezekiel if you want your book with you. Ezekiel 3 25 to 27. You can turn over the uh, Bible. 3 25 27. Uh, we see that he was struck dumb shortly after his prophet call. 3 25 27. Yeah, he was uh, struck dumb. And it is said he was, uh, uh, he remained dumb. And he uh, regained his capacity to speak. Only when the news arrived, that is in 33, 21, 22. When somebody came from Jerusalem, I took almost a year to reach there. And uh, that, by that time, uh, he, he heard that uh, Jerusalem fell. Then it is said, it is said, uh, why, why was he a prophet who, who was dumb and uh, uh, how did he practice? Practice in his ministry. So, uh, scholars would say, scholars would say, probably the, his dumbness was the, uh, due to a shock. What was first shock? In 588, his own wife, he was very, she was very dear to him. And similarly, uh, the Temple of Jerusalem was also very dear to him. And the, the person who was most dear to his wife died 588. Uh, and that time, and because of the shock, he may probably he must have become dumb. And some scholars would say this is called aphasia. Aphasia. 
scientifically speaking, aphasia. Then 587, when he knew that uh, Jerusalem, that when news reached here, they re reached him that uh, his beloved city had fallen, another shock, and in that shock, his uh, lost capacity to speak came back. So probably this was a period of maybe about a year or 13 months. Uh, he was dumb. And probably he also, that time he was also paralyzed. We will see it a little later, paralyzed. So that is a prophet who is confirmed to his house. So together with his dumbness, he was also paralyzed. And it was probably about uh, one year or 13 months. Okay. So that is next is a, a prophet to confirm his house. That is in the same section we, we can see that. We also see a symbolic act in four, four to eight. Four, four to eight. We will ex I'll explain all the prophet is symbolic actions uh, later. Probably and uh, there are different uh, interpretations for that. It was a kind of paralysis, or some would say it is a, an accurate prophecy. Some people say that it was the exiles imposed a restraint on him, and uh, uh, they would say he was confined his house, and he, this is uh, uh, this would mean that he did not deliver any prophecies orally, but only by writing. <laughs> Sorry. A prophet in exile, I said, uh, this was a prophet. This was a prophet who received his prophet to call in, in exile and exercise his ministry in exile. But you will see in the book of Ezekiel several things that he's, he's, uh, he is uh, speaking about uh, Jerusalem. Here something special also is there. Several times he is uh, undergoing translocation. He is taken to Jerusalem uh, by angels, said by angels, uh, catching hold of his hair. He was taken to Jerusalem, or even in vision. Uh, and as I will speak, maybe in vision, what all, what all things were taking place in, in the temple of Jerusalem, he sees while he is in, uh, in Jerusalem, while he is in Babylon. Okay, so that is a translocation. So he spent all his time uh, in exile. So he was a Prophet in exile, prophet in exile. And uh, then we look at the book. We said uh, 12, uh, the 48 chapters divided into uh, 10 sections. Going to the first section, that is prophetic call and commissioning. Prophetic call and commissioning. First three chapters. Uh, those who have read this book, prophet of uh, the uh, prophetic book of Ezekiel. Probably you must have been upset by looking at the first chapter. First chapter, one, 128 verses. You must have been upset understanding nothing. But you have to um, understand that this is apocalyptic literature. It, apocalyptic like writing. So we have similar uh, uh, writings in the Bible. And all apocalyptic writings are different. They are not to be understood literally. And all the details are not to be taken seriously. What is the message? of that vision, that's important. This is the vision, just like we have in the book of Ezekiel, uh, the book of Isaiah, just before his prophetic called chapters, chapter six, he also, there is also a, a vision, a heavenly vision. And uh, there also Seraphim, here we have a uh, same vision, that the, uh, the vision that we have in chapter one is repeated or uh, again we've seen in chapter 10. That is there, in, there uh, we have Cherubim. And we also have, uh, in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. And we also have before the prophetic call of Moses, Exodus 3 and 4. There, uh, there is a vision, burning bush. Uh, Moses sees the burning bush. But all these visions before the call, they have only one function. Whatever the creatures will be there, uh, the chariots will be there, uh, storm will be there, fire will be there. This all. So to, to, uh, to give the idea that God's presence is there. Moses said, remove your, your uh, sandals. This is a holy place. It's God's presence. So all these details in the vision are served to uh, say one thing. This is God's intervention. What is going to happen? What is going to happen now is from God. Heavenly council is on. A heavenly scene is uh, presented. And this, uh, that is the only purpose. And we did not break our head, uh, go into details, which are these creatures, uh, what is the chari chariot, what is, it go uh, what is it doing, nothing to worry about. 
This is just like burning bush and in Moses in the prophet called Moses or the heavenly scene of uh, uh, chapter 6 of Isaiah where Isaiah uh, is uh, uh, burning coal is taken from the altar, burning altar of the temple and uh, Isaiah is cleansed. The same way we will also see some uh, special actions in these first three chapters when Ezekiel is called. So, don't be upset about the details of this vision. Just, uh, just understand that God's presence is there. It is presented in apocalyptic terms. And once he saw this vision, uh, prophet fell down. He uh, fell down, then he is asked to get up. Then comes the act of commissioning. Act of commissioning is taking place. He is asked to, uh, to become a prophet. A prophet. Uh, 2 1 to 7, 2 1 to 7, we have an act of commissioning. 2 1 to 7, act of commissioning. Then we have sign act. There is a sign act. What is sign act? You can look at the book 2 8 to 3 3. 3. If, you, if you have the book with you, the, the Bible with you, open and see. 2 8 to 3 3, we have a sign act. He is given the, the scroll to eat. A yes, scroll uh, with uh, the contents is all uh, uh, the the disaster is coming on the dear nation of of Ezekiel. The disasters, catastrophes, all these are, are written on the on the scroll. And this scroll, he is asked to eat. Ezekiel is asked to eat, eat the scroll, and he is eating it. And when he eats it, it tastes sweet. It tastes sweet. And what is the symbolic meaning of it? This is sign act. What is the symbolic meaning of it? Symbolic meaning meaning is. Whatever he speaks, this prophet is speaking, he is coming out from God. He becomes one with the scroll. He will be speaking of only the contents of the scroll that he is eating. He becomes one with the scroll. The scroll is written by God. And what was written in the scroll is spoken by prophet. So he becomes one. Just like in the Eucharist, we, uh, we consume Eucharist and becomes part of our body and, and, and blood. Jesus' body and blood, we consume and it becomes part of our body and blood. The same way, the scroll becomes part of uh, Ezekiel and becomes he becomes identified with the, uh, the words of, uh, of Yahweh. And the, uh, the uh, immediate uh, complaints with the command given to him and that's the reason why uh, he is, uh, he is eating, his eating becomes sweet. Uh, and finally, uh, there is final sending up to eight days. After eight days, the final sending, he is asked to be uh, to become a, a watchman. A watchman. That is, we have uh, three uh, final after some final sending. We have three sixteen twenty one. Then uh, just repeated in thirty three seven nine. That is, uh, he is appointed as a watchman of God over Israel or the Jewish people who are uh, who were in uh, in Babylon. He is asked to be a watchman. What is a watchman? Means he has a specific role, especially for priest, a prophet role. Uh, it's good to look at it. He is supposed to uh, go to every person who is wicked uh, and, and tell him, please turn away from your wickedness. And uh, if he agrees, okay, well, that's fine. And he, he has saved him. And also he has to go to a, a righteous man. And if he's going away, he should also warn him, personally going, not uh, standing on the pulpit and preaching. Personally approach him and tell him uh, to keep away from, uh, from uh, evil. So this is a prophetic function given to Ezekiel. And uh, when we apply that, every, pro every priest is a prophet. And he is also uh, has this prophetic role of being a watchman. Then finally we have he shut indoors and dumb. That is where I said a little earlier. We will also look at it in the in active prophecies. That is... Uh, he is uh, he is asked to tie himself with a with a cord and he has to lie down on one side uh, for three hundred three hundred ninety days on the left side and forty days on the other side and uh, he has to be dumb. I already explained the dumbness probably not all through his life. If you uh, look at it three uh, twenty six, if you, if you if you read, it's good to read for for me, but uh, takes time. You can look at it three twenty six. He will be dumb. But the editor has, has added verse 27. 
That is not all the time. He, when the editor looked at it, he thought it is, it is a contradiction. And the prophet is asked to speak, but he is dumb. So he added verse 27. Whenever he is given a message, then his dumbness will go. So this verse is probably, uh, this section is uh, added editorially. And that was not part of the original uh, text of the book of Ezekiel. I said the present book is the final result of addition, addition, and expansion. So that which occurred in the, in the life of a proper for, for, for some time, that became uh, something uh, that spread out all through his life. That was not that was not true. That is only because of this. Then we go to uh, the uh, three different sections, that is visions, 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 parables, and enacted prophecies. Visions, the last section, appendix. We are going to the last section, appendix. So, okay. When I, when, uh, when I uh, present before you these three sections, visions, parables, and enacted prophecies, they are spread out all over the book, all over the book. So probably instead of taking each, uh, each chapter by, by chapter, when I explain all this, probably you will get the whole book uh, in front of you. Okay, first is uh, 10 visions. The, prophet, the uh, book of Ezekiel, we have in the book of Ezekiel, we have 10 visions. You, you have it on the screen. Vision of God's glory, first vision. Then vision of the sins of Jerusalem. Then vision of six executioners led by a scribe. Vision of a chariot throne on whirling, whirling wheels. Vision of Kabod leaving the temple. Vision of a cooking pot and meat. Vision of dry bones. Vision of the temple. Vision of the return of Kabod. Vision of a stream from the temple. That is from first chapter to 47 chapters. All spread out uh, everywhere. So I will explain to each one of these. Look at it. First one. Vision of God's glory, I said. Uh, we need not go to each detail of this vision. As I said, we have such visions in uh, Isaiah, in Moses, uh, we have seen, also in fourth chapter of uh, Revelation. What is important is to insist, this is to insist on divine presence. That which is taking place is from God. God is the author of the command. Hence, this also has this. Only don't worry about the creatures, the chariot, and uh, some, last time also some people had some doubts about it. This is nothing to worry. Uh, whenever Jesus also said parables, he has got a special message. The, we should not go to the details of it. We should look at the important message of it. Each parable has got a message. And other things are not, not to be taken. Our attention must not be diverted to go into the details. What is important is what is the core message of that parable. So in the same way, is this, what is the message of this vision? Vision is, this is uh, God's presence. God is present. God is calling uh, Ezekiel to be a prophet. And why he, uh, he uh, recorded this vision? Because his own people, uh, those who are, uh, those Jewish people in exile in Babylon, they rejected. They did not believe that uh, Ezekiel was called to be a prophet. So, <coughs> sorry. So that's why he had to explain all this. Then another vision, I have explained, I had to explain everything. So vision of the sins of Jerusalem. Vision of the sins of Jerusalem. Chapter, uh, go to chapter 8, 1 to 16. There are, uh, he is, see, translocation. Uh, we, I have said about translocation. Ezekiel is being taken, uh, being taken uh, by, to Jerusalem. And it is said, uh, the hand of God falls on the prophet and is lifted up by a lock of his hair and is brought to the northern entrance of the temple of Jerusalem. And there he sees four groups of people engaged in, in, in sin. First is 8, 5, and 6. If you turn over the pages, the Bible, you can see cult of Asherah. Cult of Asherah. Ezekiel sees the statue of jealousy. That is Asherah. And people are I engage in the cult of Asherah. That's a sin. Apostrophe is a sin for according to all Jewish prophets. So first thing he sees in the temple of Jerusalem, instead of worship of Yahweh, 
there takes place cult of Ashera. Second is 7 to, 7 to 13, we have the Egyptian cult, another sin. Another sin, uh, uh, the 70 elders are engaged in the Egyptian cult of, uh, uh, ador uh, of worship. Instead of rejecting Yahweh, they are engaged in, in uh, pagan worship. Next, we have 8, 14, and 15, another sin. Women are weeping, that's a liturgical weeping over Tammuz. Tammuz is a pagan god. His death, they thought that the change of season. It was the death of a god, and another season comes is the rising of a god. So it was liturgically celebrated. And finally, 16 to 18, 25 men are engaged in sun, sun worshipping, sun worshippers. So there, uh, all the priests are there. All the priests and high priests, that is number 25. 20, 25 priests are worshipping the sun. Just imagine, instead of Yahweh, they are worshipping uh, uh, worshiping the sun. The prophet is uh, given the vision of four sins going on in the temple of Jerusalem. That is uh, in the chapter chapter 8 of Isaiah. Then we have ch chapter 9, go to chapter 9, 1 to 11. We have vision of six executioners led by a scribe or a priest. Six, six executioners means those who are ready to kill. A group of six people, those who are ready to kill, are led by a priest or a scribe. And they are going to uh, Jerusalem. And their duty is first, they have to write Tau. Tau is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet on the, on the forehead of all innocent people. And after uh, Pointing this, writing this tav on the, uh, the on the forehead of the innocent people, then they have to execute all the sinners. They have seen, uh, Ezekiel has seen the, the sin, sinful people in Jerusalem, and God uh, God is sending this uh, team of executioners to kill all those who are sinners, all, all those who are engaged in and uh, various types of sin. Next is uh, chapter 10, 1 to 17. Just like the chapter 1, vision of chapter, uh, chapter 1, we also have a vision of a chariot throne on whirling wheels. Chapter 10, uh, 1 to 7. That is uh, uh, another vision. The, there, uh, those who are in the, in the throne, they are asked to give, they are given a command. They have to take burning coals from the sanctuary of the temple and scatter them over the city. In the vision of Isaiah, chapter 6 of Isaiah, uh, the seraphim, they take one of the, uh, the seraphim, they, he, he takes uh, burning coal from the altar of the temple and cleanses uh, prophet Isaiah. Here, burning coal is taken and scattered over the city, or the dead bodies of the city. The previous executioners have executed a lot of people, and in this vision, uh, a chariot people, they had to spread out uh, burning coals, and all, all the dead bodies will be burned. The next is vision of Kabod leaving the temple. Kabod is a Hebrew word, means glory of God. It's almost a personalized concept. God is transcendent. God as such will not stay in, uh, in according to Jewish people. They couldn't even pronounce the name of Yahweh. See, they would write Yahweh and they would pronounce us Adonai. Nobody would, uh, no Jewish person would ever uh, pronounce the word Yahweh. They would say, always call, they would write Yahweh and pronounce it Adonai. Then you can just imagine uh, keep, uh, thinking of God himself coming and staying in the temple of Jerusalem. That was impossible. So the glory of God, which they said, uh, Kabod, Kabod was leaving the temple. Why? Because the temple was full of uh, sin, mischief, uncleanliness. So uh, the God, the God, God's glory was forced to leave, and Ezekiel saw it in his vision. Uh, God's glory leaving the temple of Jerusalem. That is chapter 10, 18 to 22 plus 11, 20 to 25. You can just turn over the pages and look at it. The next is vision of a cooking pot and meat. Vision of a cooking pot and meat. There, you see, he sees a cooking pot. In the cooking pot, there is <clears throat> there is meat, and the meat is being cooked. And 
the people think that uh, <coughs> they are safe. There are two, two things of uh, two uh, possibilities are there. One is uh, they, they think that they are safe because it is inside the port. Second is second thing is that is a uh, false security. Second is uh, defeatism, pessimism. So uh, in this vision, he sees, okay, a port is there, and the, in the port, a port, that is Jerusalem, that inside the meat, uh, inside the port is meat, meat is the people of Jerusalem. Then we have chapter 37, go to chapter 37, that is vision of dry bronze, dry bones. A uh, prophet is taken translocation to a valley of uh, dead bones, and there he's asking, and uh, God is asking, can these uh, uh, decaying uh, bonds come back to life? He says, no, I have no idea. You know it. He doesn't uh, answer directly, but uh, God, you know it. And when it is uh, made clear to him that uh, uh, normally they can never come back to life. That's an impossible thing. What is impossible to human beings is possible for God. And he's, uh, in this vision, Ezekiel is made sure or is convinced that Yahweh has the power to bring back these dry bones or decaying bones, uh, they are uh, symbol, symbols of, of the fallen Israel. They are li like dry bones that can never come back to life. But Yahweh has a capacity to bring them back to life. So, you know, uh, Ezekiel, he has got uh, two contrasts. First is, he spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem. He loved it, but uh, whatever things he wanted, he could not say. Whatever Yahweh told him he had to say. So he spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem. Once it is, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, he spoke, he always spoke about the restoration of Jerusalem and the restoration of uh, God's presence. So here he gives through the vision of dry bones, he says, uh, the destroyed Jerusalem, Israel will be rebuilt or restored. That is the uh, meaning of the dry, uh, vision of dry bones. But the Christians take it as a uh, prophecy about resurrection. At that time, Jewish people had no idea about resurrection. Until the apocalyptic time, they had no idea about resurrection. That's why most of the Psalms which use as prayer, our church prayer, evening prayer, morning prayer, night prayer, we use a lot of uh, Psalms as, as prayers, but most of the Psalms, uh, early Psalms especially, have no idea about resurrection. The people, the Jewish people thought that uh, grave was the end of human human life. Everything ended in human life. That's why uh, some psalmists were uh, praying to God, God, why do you kill me? If you, if, you, if you kill me, you are the loser. If I am alive, there will be one more person to raise hallelujah to you. But if I die, out of if there are 100 people, I will, one will be less 19. There will be 99 to say hallelujah. So keep me alive. So yeah, some psalmists would say, so they thought everything was over. Sheol was the end of uh, end of human life, and Sheol even God has no presence there. God doesn't go there. Uh, he has no no power there. So to us, uh, end end was uh, Sheol. So this idea when the vision of the uh, vision of dry bones was uh, seen by Ezekiel, I mean it was it was shared by other people. They had no idea about resurrection, but Christians uh, we see it as a prophecy of resurrection. Vision of the temple, chapter 40, uh, 1 to 40 to uh, 20. Uh, this vision, a vision of the temple, that is, <clears throat> we have two, two ideas of the temple, two ideas of the temple. Actually, in 1 Kings chapter 6, we, we have a description of the temple. How the Solomon built the temple. There we have details of a temple. Here in the vision of the, of the temple, Ezekiel's vision of the temple, he was translocated to Jerusalem and uh, he's explained, uh, explaining the temple which he saw in vision. There, the, even including the measurement is given, the measurements are not same. And uh, uh, people say who, which, is, uh, which is correct. One is actual one that is in Solomon, uh, Solomon's temple given in uh, chapter 6 of 1 Kings. Here we have that which uh, Ezekiel saw as temple, as temple, including the structures and so on, is seen there. So he would, uh, here he is trying to say that 
though the temple is uh, destroyed it will be rebuilt restored he ha he was actually uh, to, of two contradiction i said one is uh, destruction the other one is restoration so this is here he was explained the vision as play in the vision he was trying to understand or try to con convey the idea that uh, uh, the temple will be re uh, reconstructed then we go to parables next is parables that is uh, first parable is parable of the wine wood parable of the wine wood go to chapter 15 1 to 8 chapter 15 1 to 8 actually people of israel uh, were normally compared to wine so here he sees he gives a, a parable okay parable and allegories parables and allegories in the parable he says uh, israel is like a piece of wine wood burned on both sides he is trying to explain okay and he is like a wine wood burned on both sides how this piece of wine wood burned on both sides wine wood represents israel on both sides burned that is two incidents of 722 bc and 598 bc what happened 722 bc 722 bc assyrians came and captured the northern israel that is first uh, great blow received by the northern people 598 is first blow received by southern people and both are uh, both have affected both these incidents have affected the people of israel so the wine wood burned on both sides that is uh, he is presenting israel uh, like a wine wood uh, burned on both sides so he says through this prophet life will be short as that of wine wood the life of israel will be short as that of the wine wood then we have the allegorical history of Jerusalem, chapter 16, 1 to 63. It's a big chapter, allegorical history. In an allegory, he is saying, and how he is saying it is like a story. He says, Jerusalem was, uh, Israel or Jerusalem was like a newborn child, abandoned in the open space. Yahweh took care of her, brought her up as a beautiful young woman. And when she was of marriageable age, Yahweh married her. According to the present uh, social law or moral law, uh, one who uh, brings up a child cannot marry that child. That is present day law. But the, this child, abandoned child, was uh, brought up by Yahweh. Uh, and when she was a beautiful woman, when she was of marriageable age, Yahweh married her and uh, looked after her, gave her uh, attractive costumes, all jewels and everything, became Yahweh's wife. But after some time, she forgot what all things Yahweh did for her and ran after lovers, infuriating Yahweh, husband and foster father. So, uh, Ezekiel is presenting the history of uh, Jerusalem and the people of Israel in, a, in an allegorical way. They have, uh, they have been unfaithful to Yahweh. Next is allegory. We have, we have, since we had to complete, I am uh, going faster. Allegory of eagles, uh, chapter 17, 1 to 21. Two eagles. He speaks of two eagles. Uh, two eagles. One is uh, the king of uh, Babylon. The, next, the other one is uh, king of Egypt. Two eagles. Two eagles. And first is, they are saying, they took a tip of uh, a trip from uh, Lebanon and planted in, in, in Jerusalem. That is Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim, uh, in 598, this small prince, young prince was taken to Babylon. So the eagle, that is Nebuchadnezzar, came and took away uh, Jehoiakim to Babylon. The uh, first eagle. Then the seed of the land, that is Zedekiah, 1598, the angle of Jeho Jehoiakim was installed king and he's not he is presented here seed of the land he was planted there but when he turned his uh, hand or head towards the second great eagle that's egypt then the wind east wind that's god's anger struck him and he was also taken <coughs> yeah, he was uh, butchered by babylonians next is fable of sedar you know what is fable fable means stories where characters are uh, trees or animals through this uh, fable that is 17 
chapter 17, 20 to 24, uh, the, the prophet is saying there will be, he is uh, expressing the hope that a future Davidic king, king will be coming. And this is his hope that in the future uh, the, there will be uh, a future king rising from the family of, uh, of David. Then parable of lioness and the whelps, chapter 19, 1 to 9. Lioness and the whelps. whelps. Lioness is Israel and two whelps. That is Jehoiakas and Jehoiakin. If we, if we have studied the book of Kings and the uh, book of, book of, uh, books of Samuel, we'll understand this. Jehoiakas. Jehoiakas was the younger son of Josiah who was killed in 609 at Megiddo. And uh, then when people in uh, Jerusalem heard that their King Jehoiah has, Je uh, Josiah was killed in, at Megiddo in 609, the people made the younger son, Jehoiah has, uh, the king of Jerusalem. But after some time, when Pharaoh Necho came back from Mesopotamia back to, uh, he was going back to Egypt, he removed Jehoiah has because he did not like him. And he installed his elder son, uh, Josiah's elder son, that's Jehoiah king as the king of Jerusalem. And he took Jehoiah to Egypt. That is first 12. That is young uh, child of uh, Linus, uh, Israel. And second wealth uh, is Jehoiah king. He has said a few times. That is uh, the son of Jehoiah king. That is the grandson of uh, Josiah. Jehoiah king, he was taken to, he, uh, to Babylon in 598. First is 609. So the second is 598. So this parable will speak about this. Jeremiah also speaks about this historical event. Then allegory of withered wine. That is chapter 19, 10 to 14. So uh, a wine is a uh, royal stem is planted in a, a dry land, dry and thirsty land. Dry and thirsty land is Babylon. This allegory about exile. It is allegory about exile. The wine uh, was planted in a dry and thirsty land. That is, wine is Israel, planted in a dry and thirsty land. That is Babylon. Then, parable of Ohola and Oholiba. Even the, hearing the name, you will get astonished. Ohola and Oholiba. Ohola, meaning is her own tent. Oholiba, my tent in her. Actually, through this parable, Isaac is trying to speak about the infidelity of northern Israel. When and uh, ten tribes uh, split away from southern Israel under Rehoboam. Uh, and Rehoboam was in southern Israel. Jeroboam first was in the northern Israel. Ten tribes uh, split away, uh, went away from the, uh, Jerusalem. And there they made their own worship center. And that's why Oholiva, uh, Oholiva uh, means, her own ten means, she made her own worship place, which Yahweh did not like. My tent in her means Yahweh was worshipped. Uh, his, uh, his worship place was made in Jerusalem. So, yeah, yeah, prophet through this parable disapproves, uh, expresses disapproval of Yahweh about the northern Israel and approval of southern Israel. Parable of cooking and boiling. Cooking and boiling. Then two incidents are here. One is festive meal, parable of the festive meal. When, when there is a danger, when there is a danger, uh, will there be, will anybody make a festive meal? Festive meal, not possible. And uh, that is one, one thing. So that is irresponsibility, irresponsibility of the people of, of uh, Jerusalem. They, were, they behave irresponsibly. Then cleaning port. Uh, cleaning port. He is a, he, uh, na, he, na, another, uh, sometimes uh, ordinary people also may know that. For cleaning purpose in the kitchen, uh, the servants or uh, women, they heat it up again. So after heating it up, it is easy to clean. So uh, there he says, cleaning a pot. That is uh, that is uh, symbolic of destruction, coming destruction. Then chapters 29, 31 and 32. There are four allegories. Allegory of Crocodile, allegory of mighty cedar tree, then allegory of dragon in the sea, and allegory of Egypt's descent into the
and the Shayah. Allegories are about the, the, the fall of Jerusalem, fall of Egypt, fall of Egypt. Their pride and their fall. Yahweh will finally see that the pride of Egypt will, will be punished and uh, they will be destroyed. That is the uh, through, through uh, two allegories and two uh, parables. Prophet Ezekiel is expressing uh, about the future, the, the, the inevitable destruction of Egypt. Then we go to enacted prophecies. The third section, enacted prophecies. That is, what, is, what are enacted prophecies or symbolic actions? Instead of saying orally a prophecy, a prophet is acting out. For example, if you have uh, already learned uh, Isaiah, in chapter 20 of Isaiah, we, have, we, we see, Isaiah spoke barefoot, uh, walked barefoot and, uh, and naked for three years to express a, a message. That is, Egypt and Ethiopia, they, they will be destroyed to say that. He walked, walked around naked and barefoot. And when we see the enacted prophecies of some, some of the prophets, our conclusion will be they are madmen. Sometimes we, uh, nowadays, very little we see. But uh, some years ago, we could see on the streets and so on, people who are mad. Or big cities, we can still see mad people. They are, uh, their actions are not rational. And when we look at the, uh, the behavior of the prophets, we will say they are no better than a madman. Otherwise, you can, can you imagine a prophet walking barefoot and naked for three years? Yeah, if you look at it literally, that's a different question whether uh, he did it literally. Anyway, so uh, enacted prophecies or symbolic actions, that is actually prophecies. But instead of orally explaining, this is acting out. The first one is chapter 2, uh, 8 to 3, 3. Chapter 2, 8, uh, 2, 8 to 3, 3. We already explained that. Uh, he was given a scroll and a scroll contained disasters and and catastrophe is coming, and he announced all that, all that the Jerusalem will fall, the temple will be destroyed, all that he said, and they are all written. And that is symbolically, he he had ate the scroll, and, uh, and instead of preaching it, he did that, and that explained, uh, that uh, gave uh, a prophecy, a prophetic message. Second, second is enactment of a siege. Uh, you can go to chapter 4. Uh, enactment of a siege. He took, uh, our uh, prophet took a clay brick and on the clay brick uh, he uh, drew or he made a, a city and how a city is under, under siege. Uh, if, you are, no, if you know what a siege is, ancient times, any safe city should have a uh, city wall. Without a city wall, there are no open cities. Any city that was serious about its a security had city walls. City walls had uh, only one big gate, and that was 24 hours guarded. So, in order to capture a city, uh, they had to the enemy enemy had to come and stay outside the city wall, and somehow maybe for six months, one year, two years, stay camping outside. They had to cross over over the 30, 40 feet high wall. They had to cross over the wall through the gate, they would now be able to enter because only a few people can enter. That time there will be a big con contingent of army inside. They would now be able to defeat. There were no helicopters. There were no bombings. So that is siege. So he had to uh, act out a siege, making a, uh, this on a, on a uh, brick clay. Third is sign act of lying on one side. He had to, uh, we have already seen that before. We said, Probably it was like a uh, par paralysis together with this dumbness, uh, not for all through his life. This is just like uh, for some time. Sign act of lying one side and uh, uh, lying on another side. There are plenty of in interpretations of this one. Uh, scientifically, uh, difficult to understand, but uh, scientifically it is, it is paralysis. One side, 390 days. Another side, 40 days. And he said, it is days of, of the sins of Israel. And several uh, uh, several interpretations are there. One is from the first building of the Temple of Jerusalem to the to destruction. That is uh, uh, 977 to uh, 587. 
Then 40, exam 40 will not come. That is 587 to uh, 539. Uh, plenty of other interpretations also are there. Days of, uh, days of exile. That is, uh, if, you, if you take those letters in Hebrew, that will become uh, 390. Or some others would say 390 plus 40 would be 430 uh, 30 years. Uh, that is their time of uh, 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 exile. Their time of they are coming from out of Egypt, reaching here. So various interpretations are there. But uh, he's asked to lie down on one side for 390 days, another days, another another side for 40 days. Then the symbolic act of preparing unclean and rationed food. Unclean and rationed food. So he is asked, God, God is asking him to prepare unclean food and rationed food. That is, he has to prepare, he has to collect some uh, meager uh, vegetables and make uh, bread out of it. And after making it, not very good things, but uh, a very poor things. He, he collects poor things and makes a, a bread and he's asked to cook it on a uh, human dung. Here, uh, and, and uh, uh, Kerala people may not understand what is cow dung being used as, as uh, fuel. North India, we can see uh, in the villages and so on, the, yeah, the women, they uh, dry out here. Yeah. Uh, cow dung and we use it for a uh, fuel. Here, uh, Ezekiel is, uh, is asked to prepare this, cook this uh, food, his bread over human dung. He was totally upset. He said, please God, I can do anything that you say except this. This is impossible. Then God gives a, a, a special exception. Okay, use cow dung instead. So on cow dung, he uh, prepared this uh, bread. Bread uh, not made of good things, but uh, rather poor things. This is to explain this act. Uh, people would, uh, would ask him, what, what are you doing? What, what is the meaning of this act, acting? Then he says, see, this is symbolic of coming days of poverty. And there will be shortage of food. That's why very uh, poor uh, bread is made. Then you'll be eating bread in unclean land, coming exile. You'll be eating uh, in uh, uh, in uh, unclean land. You have to remember, while in Babylon, it is speaking about what is going to happen in Jerusalem. He's already, some people are already there. 598, some people are already there, 10,000 people. But again, 598, then after 11 years, 5 is 87 only, uh, the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, the city was destroyed, and uh, people are taken into exile. Okay, that is a, a second exile. So, it, so, in between, he is speaking all this, okay, preparing unclean and ration food. Then, symbolic act of sharing and dividing, five, chapter 5, 1 to 4. That is, he is asked to take a sword, not a razor, and shave his head and beard. And it's a long process. He has to take a sword and shave his head and beard. It is a sign of mourning. The way the hair and divide it into three parts, weighing and more and numbering are signs of impending doom and judgment. When the first one third of hair in the midst of the city, that's a city made on a, a clay brick. These represent the people perishing in the siege due to hunger and plague. Now, ne next action in this symbolic action, strike with the knife second, the second one third of the hair. Uh, around the city, that is model on the model, model of bricks. This might refer to those in place, those in places outside Jerusalem, to those who escape from Jerusalem but are taken by Babylonians. Means before the fall of 587, he is saying and uh, doing all these to, uh, to tell the people that disaster is coming. The next uh, fifth action: scatter the third one third hair in the wind. This refers to the people who will go into exile afresh. Then actually is bind up a few of the hairs in his court. This might refer to exiles who will elude the sword and will survive. Then finally, throw some of the hair in the skirt, uh, in, the skirt in, in the fire. This might, it might signify that some exiles will have the same fate as that of Jerusalem. Means some of them will be killed. Then uh, the next is chapter 12, 1 to 28. Acts, symbolic of exile. Acts, symbolic of exile. 
there two enact prophecies are there first is he has to prepare an excel's baggage he has to pack an excel's bundle by daylight while the people watch so that he can set off for excel in the evening next <coughs> he has to make a hole in the wall while the people watch so that he can go through the wall go through go out through it just as exiles are taken out of the city then he has to cover his face so that he cannot see the ground just as exiles will be led out blindfolded then in the evening he has to go out through the hole into the dark completing the sign act so just just imagine sometimes it is difficult for, for us to understand to say that those who are in jerusalem in a, in a few years time is already before 5 it is and he say the people who are remaining in jerusalem they will be taken into exile just to convey the idea he is acting it out then eating and drinking with fear and trembling that is chapter 12 17 to 20 this is a symbol of panic through the section of uh, through this action of eating that is disaster will come Uh, on jerusalem jerusalemites unexpectedly uh, they will be shivering then 21 1 to 7 prophecy of sigh and relief sigh and grief okay prophecy of sigh and grief so he has to sigh and groan before before the massive his heart breaks okay so this is also that the disaster is coming on israel then another prophecy of cry wail and clap he has to cry very and at the end clap this is exactly what the are the mad people do they will cry cry for some time then they will uh, clap hands in joy so first is he is crying because of the disaster coming over yeah uh, israel then he is clapping because he is approving what yahweh is <coughs> yahweh is doing our uh, our israel next is symbolic act of marking two ways so he has to make on the clay symbolic act he has to make on a on a clay two ways of the marching of the king of babylon okay and two ways one is to ammon the other one is to jerusalem this so you have to remember this all taking place before 587 the final fall of jerusalem so symbolically saying uh, say he is saying the king of babylon will march and it will march from babylon so he is making a way and two cities are shown one is ammon the other one is jerusalem so when he made this people said okay, okay let me let, let him go to ammon and he said and uh, second says no he is not going to ammon he is going to jerusalem disaster is coming on uh, jerusalem that is a symbolic way of making two ways then symbolic act of mourning is wife death and being dumb that is sometimes when we when i read i feel so bad about the whole thing and that is uh, just to act out the god is saying in order to, to tell the people that uh, uh, jerusalem is going to fall uh, this uh, symbolic act is his own wife is dying he is 35 so his wife must be a uh, much younger than him and he is he is already told your wife will die and normally when uh, when somebody is relative dies he has a funeral right morning right but he can, he should not do that okay he should not do any uh, morning right such as walking barefoot bareheaded and groaning loudly these things he cannot do ezekiel will be deprived of this his eyes delight that is his wife uh, the jews will jewish people will under, will not understand what is the meaning of it those who are seeing it his own wife he loved his wife so much but when he when she died he is acting as if uh, nothing happened but he is just obeying god he cannot do that that is when people ask him why is it because he is uh, his wife is so beloved to him in the same way jerusalem is so beloved to him and jerusalem also will fall like this okay and uh, the personal tragedy of a sudden death of his wife okay and this made him dumb i said earlier probably this was the shock i, I said aphasia is a, is a disease i have uh, read the newspapers and i had also cut newspaper uh, cutouts i had kept uh, that is 
uh, in an accident, somebody lost his uh, capacity to speak. And up sometimes he had uh, he underwent another accident. And he got back his capacity to speak. So in our own time, this has happened. So that's why scholars would say uh, uh, a prophet being dumb means not all through his life. And I, according to scholars, probably in 588, when, when his wife died because of the shock, he became dumb. And probably also became paralyzed. Just so we can shock to him. And after uh, 13 months, that is a 587, and uh, the news should, should reach uh, him in Babylon, take some time. Uh, so uh, by the time the news came that the Jerusalem fell, another shock. Remember, at the age of 25, he was going to be ordained a priest, a Jewish priest in the, in the temple of Jerusalem. But uh, he could not do that. And he was taken to to Babylon. Or according to the second tradition at the age of 30, he could have been ordained a priest. Instead, he was called to be a prophet. Now, he is a, uh, he, he has married and lost his wife, his uh, most beloved person. And second, and became done. Second time, second big shock, that is, his beloved city has fallen. And with that shock, he is a lost capacity to speak, must have come back. Then the next is symbolic act of two sticks, uh, holding two sticks together. Symbolic act of uh, holding two sticks together. That is, <clears throat> uh, many prophets, many prophets had uh, great hopes about uh, uh, their kingdom, their uh, Jewish kingdom, okay? And he thought, even Ezekiel, all their hopes did not come true. And he, he kept two sticks together, thinking that the northern Israel and the southern Israel will come together and become a, will once again become a kingdom. That did not happen. Okay. So that is another symbolic act. So we have seen uh, 12 symbolic actions. 12 symbolic actions. Once again, we say uh, 10 visions uh, we have seen in various parts of the book of Ezekiel. Then we have seen 12 parables and allegories. And third, we have seen 12 symbolic acts or uh, enacted prophecies. Sim uh, 12 symbolic acts or enacted prophecies. Then we have finally, one of the most important topics of this book is personal responsibility. Personal responsibility, that is, a. Uh, uh, Chapter 14, chapter 14, 12, 12, uh, 12 to 23, then that is Appendix 4. <clears throat> then correction of a tradition, chapter 18, 1 to 32. Then conversion of the wicked. Just turn over the pages and look at it. That is individual culpability. Please look at it. Chapter 14, 12 to 23. Turn over the pages. Uh, you can see on the screen there, uh, 14, 12, 23. Then we have correction of a tradition, chapter 18, 1 to 32. Then conversion of the wicked, chapter 33, 10 to 20. This is one of the important theological themes of the book of Ezekiel. You must have heard uh, from the retreat preachers that, uh, quoting from the, um, the Old Testament, that uh, you will be punished from the third, your parents and grandparents' uh, mistakes, you will be punished. But Ezekiel says, no. He says, that tradition I am correcting. That's not true. Chapter 18 is a correction of a tradition. Each person will be punished or will be responsible only for his actions. Individual culpability. You are not responsible. A father is not responsible for, the, for, uh, for his sons. Uh, culpability or son is not responsible for his father's culpability. Okay. The same way uh, it's, it is true that uh, there was a tradition that uh, uh, parents and grandparents sins will be uh, the punishment of sins will come upon the third generation. He says no. That is not correct. So chapter 14 we have individual responsibility and culpability. If, for example in Genesis we see Abraham interceding for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Uh, but uh, Prophet Ezekiel announces punishment to Jerusalem because of 
her present sins, not counting on her past. Jerusalem is will be punished not because of their past sins, but present sins. In highlight is individual responsibility. Chapter 18. Chapter 18, 1 to 32. Uh, we have a correction of a tradition. Look at it. Chapter 18, 1 to 4, correction of a tradition. Then 5 to 9, righteous ways of man. Then evil ways of his son. 18, 10 to 13. Should a son no, suffer for the iniquity of his father? He says, no. The Lord's justice for converted sinners and perverted righteous. Okay. Um, um, if a sinner is converted, God will, uh, God will uh, reward him. Then perverted just That's why uh, the, the uh, prophet is, given, is made watchman. He should see that the, the, the sinner must be converted. He should be brought back to the right path. And he should see that righteous will never go astray. That is our prophetic duty. As priests of our, our prophetic duty. Then repent and turn away from evil and get a new heart. Repent and turn away from uh, from uh, our wicked ways and uh, come to the righteous path. Okay. I would uh, like to uh, tell you about one, uh, one, uh, part, uh, one passage. That is Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, 26. All of you may please take chapter 36. You can see on the screen. Chapter 36, 26. One important passage. Chapter 36, uh, 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Okay, in the beginning of the class, I said a few things. Uh, uh, shalom, Ashlom, Ha, To, Mayod, uh, To, Tada, Lo, To, uh, To, Daraba, a lot of things. Now, uh, many of our people, uh, many of the people, especially uh, uh, Hindus, they know some, some, uh, some, uh, script, some verses of the scripture in Sanskrit. Muslims know the uh, Quran in, in uh, Arabic or uh, Urdu or something. But our people have no idea. Okay, our people have no idea. You can uh, look at the screen of your uh, mobile and see whether uh, where you, you can follow that. You have to remember, yeah, we have to read from right to left. Right to left, you know, English, just opposite. We uh, read from uh, right to left. Venatati. If you want, you can re repeat with me. Venatati, I'll give lahem to you. Venatati lahem lev hadas new heart. Lev means heart. Lev hadas new heart. And ve ruva hadasa new spirit and a new spirit. Once again, I say venatati lahem lev hadas. I'll give you a new heart. And ve ruva hadasa yetten bekir behem. I will give and a spirit. I will put new spirit within you. So I will give you a new heart and I will give a new spirit within you. Then, Ve Hasiruti, Ve Hasiruti, yet Lev Hayaben. And I will take away the heart of stone. I will take away the heart of stone. Uh, then, Me Besarhem, Me Besarhem, out of your flesh. Ve Natati, Lahem. Leave Basar and I'll give you a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh. Once again, uh, I say, I can, if, if you can't, just look at it. Ve Natati, Ve Natati, I will give you, I will give Lahem to you. Leave, Leave Hades, Leave Hades, new heart, new heart. Where Ruwa Hadesa is. A uh, new spirit. Yetten be birke birkehem. That is, I will put within you. Ve wa hasiroti. Wa hasiroti yet lev hayeben. And I will take away heart of stone. Lev means heart. Yeben means stone. Heart of stone. Me besarhem. Out of your flesh. And ve natati. I will give. What? 
la came to you lev basa i will give you a heart of flesh so this is probably uh, we want uh, what is one of the most important passages uh, which we should remember from ezekiel i would say this is the passage when at the la came lev hades where uva hadisa yetten bekir behem ve wa hasirati yet lev hayaben we berse mi basarhen ve natdi lahen lev basar and i'll give you a heart of flesh if possible uh, look at it and uh, learn if you can learn in hebrew try to learn it at least otherwise learn at least in uh, in english okay uh, probably it's only a few more minutes one or two minutes more i will uh, conclude here uh, and now if this this little time what I, what i could do i was trying to say and if you want you can ask me some uh, some doubts if you have